I acutely remember waking up face down in the water going, okay, well, I know why I'm here. I know where I am. I need to get out. And I couldn't. But I do remember being pulled out, laying on my back, them saying, we're going to put you in the recovery position. Can you move your leg? And I was like, no. And they were like, don't joke about that. I'm like, not call an ambulance. But it's when they call my parents. Uh, they, my parents were away celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. Uh, so you've got to go through the cycle of coming up against all of these first interactions with life as a wheelchair user. So yeah, pretty massive life-changing event. But at the same time, some incredibly positive things came out of it almost straight away. One of them was... Richard, welcome to Getting There with Amy Claire. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I'm just going to let you introduce uh, let you introduce yourself, pardon me, um, for the listeners and viewers. Okay, so my name's uh, Richard Cartwright. Uh, I think we know each other because I, you're one of my students. I've worked at the University of Southampton for about eight years. I moved into academia a couple of years before that, but I'm actually a chartered accountant by background, and my career's kind of gone full loop. Uh, and I'm now practicing accountant again, but in a non-exec capacity, uh, working a number of organizations on their boards. Okay, amazing. <laughs> nice introduction. Thank you for that. Um, your first event, we just tend to delve straight into these. Your first event is um, Life at University. Mm -hmm. um, it was a bit of a profound experience view for many different ways. Yeah. Tell me about that. Sure. So I, my background and my upbringing was kind of very much 2.4 children I suppose um, my parents were uh, sort of quite keen for us to go to university they were both graduates um, you know loving family all the rest of it uh, but you know a small c conservative upbringing uh, and university for me was this big opportunity to get away from the homestead uh, to be kind of a bit selfish, go somewhere that I wanted to go, do something that I wanted to do in terms of the subject, pursue all of my extracurricular interests, but in my own skin, I guess, maybe for the first time. I had three brilliant years uh, at the University of Birmingham. Uh, I came up to graduating for my degree in economics and I was lucky enough to secure a job. And then after, literally just after starting work, I went back to a freshers week, which I was kind of overqualified for in the sense I'd already graduated to see some mates, um, you know, to celebrate, you know, life basically being great. And um, yeah, very sadly, uh, uh, an evening out at the students union turned, uh, turned, turned bad quite quickly. I think probably everyone's seen Friends, right? And they've seen the scene where they're all dancing around in the fountain. Oh, yes. That is kind of how I expected my night to end. The university fountain had some water in it uh, and was, you know, sprinkling away. It looked gorgeous. And I, you know, had a bit to drink uh, uh, along with my friends. I spent all evening trying to convince them that it would be a great idea to jump around the fountain. And they spent most of the evening trying to tell me that would be a really stupid idea and that we should just go home. So this was your idea, was it? Or was your friends? Yeah, no, it was definitely my idea. And I think that was kind of something that was quite hard for my parents to grasp afterwards. But yeah, it was absolutely my idea. And literally at the end of the night, I took my wallet and mobile out of my pockets. I gave them to my friend, took my hoodie off, and I sort of walked towards this fountain in sort of jubilant mood. And because I'd had a bit too much to drink, I put my hands over my head and did a racing dive rather than jumping in as I'd intended. Uh, my other friends, who kind of had agreed, sort of went the other side of the pedestal. He sort of saw out the corner of my eye, his eye, that I sort of dived in and went, mm, okay, that's brave. Uh, but he jumped in, thank goodness, the other side. Uh, and literally, just when he turned around, he saw me being pulled out by a bouncer uh, and, uh, and, and being put on my back. And, uh, yeah, in that moment, I 
you know, my life had changed. I, I sort of, I, maybe I was unconscious, I don't really know, but for, just for a, f a very few seconds, or even maybe a fraction of a second, but I acutely remember waking up face down in the water going, okay, well, I know why I'm here. I know where I am. I need to get out. And I couldn't. And then I was like, well, okay, well, I need to roll over so I can breathe or I need to push my way out. And the level of injury that I'd sustained in an instant meant that I had no power in my upper body. And, um, and the muscles that you use to sort of push or swim just weren't functioning anymore. And at that point, I thought, oh, shh. You can swear anyway. I, yeah, I need, to, I need to breathe at least. So I tried to roll over and I couldn't do that either. And at that moment, I thought, oh, my God. And that's when I was pulled out. Now, all of that might have taken 30 seconds, two seconds. I can't really remember or tell. But I do remember being pulled out, laying on my back, them saying, we're going to put you in the recovery position. Can you move your leg? And I was like, no. And they were like, don't joke about that. I'm like, not call an ambulance. Very fortunately, an ambulance station was literally a couple of hundred meters away. And within a couple of minutes, I was on my way to hospital. But yeah, that's kind of... It's a bit of a downer on the university experience. I had three wonderful years. They transformed my life. I have met people that are still really close friends with me afterwards. But it also had this flip side of me going back to the place that I love so much. And sustaining a life-changing injury. Uh, and effectively, for, for the sort of technical <laughs> aspects, I broke my neck, uh, the fifth vertebrae in my neck, and that resulted in paralysis from my shoulders down. And associated with that, I I'd only have partial use of my hands, which is something which makes my life much more complicated than just not walking. So yeah, pretty massive, life-changing event. But at the same time, some incredibly positive things came out of it almost straight away. One of them was that uh, the company I'd elected to work for turned out to be brilliant. Uh, I called in sick, which is probably a little crazy when you've just had that sort of level of injury. Uh, but I was kind of adamant for my induction they sort of said it's really important if you're injured or ill or whatever that you call in sick and somewhere that had lodged in the back of my brain so although my friends who had sort of gathered around my bedside and family were like you don't need to do this we'll we'll take it off uh, off your hands I called in um and they were you know very supportive I think quite shocked uh, you know I, I had done I, what had happened had happened uh but it's when they called my parents. Uh, they, my parents were away celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary uh, on a cruise. And the message got through to them. And they were coming back to the UK and they just got a phone call from my new boss, a guy called Phil Cotton. And he was, you know, obviously, almost had no words to kind of explain what what had happened and how sorry they were but the thing that really changed my life was the fact that he sort of said we've had a wheelchair user in the office before it's the last thing on your mind at the moment but if and when Richard wants to get back to work there's no question his job will be waiting for him and that set me on a completely different path to perhaps everyone else that I met in my rehabilitation uh, from my spinal cord injury because I had a job to go back to, although I felt I had just messed up the 21 years I'd put in hard work, you know, to graduate with a good degree, get a good job, make my parents proud or whatever, <laughs> you know, whatever else was going on in my head at the time. I thought I'd blown it and to have that offer and that reassurance was of enormous support. It's really interesting listening to all this because it's such a life-changing moment 
but also you mention um you reflect upon how this you had this new job lined up right so it wasn't as just simple as what do i say simple as right um definitely not simple but um okay you all other aspects of your life but you also thought that it actually might impact your career prospects yeah. in terms of that i mean the company I was working for was a big brand name, yeah. so it's very unlikely they're going to fire you. A, elite, if that's probably illegal, but B, you know, immoral. But if I'd been an electrician and the axe, you know, I, I'd had to sustain the same injury, that would be game over because I literally wouldn't be able to do the job. And there are lots of people that I met in hospital who had had accidents uh who are like chefs or plumbers or you know maybe even they were able to go back to their job but they've had their accident at a later stage in their career or their their sort of life and they were the major bread earner whereas i had decided to start my graduate job back in you know southampton back living with my parents just as a bit of a safety net not thinking that I would need it for this reason, but just in case it didn't work out. And, um, yeah, I, in some ways, given I'd been really stupid and also really unlucky, I was really lucky that I was 21 years old, so I'd been and done a number of things and sort of seen how the world had worked a little bit. I'd secured my job, so I was not going out into the workplace trying to justify why someone should employ me I kind of managed to do that I then just had to make good on the investment that they were again gonna then make in me and um yeah I it was it was a long road I spent nine months a week and a day in hospital um a year to the day after I had started my graduate job I was back at work doing exactly the same job at the same desk uh, but I sort of just describe it as a very different chair. Um, uh, and they were enormously supportive. I worked uh, part-time for a year trying to get my sort of stamina and resilience up. Uh, and then I restarted my graduate contract um, two years effectively after my accident. And um, that's a, that was a three-year program, which I sort of managed to complete three and a half years uh, and in total five and a half years after I, I, I started but yeah enormously fortunate and um, you know that's why I, I, I recommend to a lot of my students you know working within professional services working for one of these major firms is tough experience it's hard work but they really do look after you uh, and um, and yeah I if I were to start my career again I would clearly try and avoid going to a freshers' week that I shouldn't have been at, uh, but I would do pretty much everything else the same. I I would go and work for the same firm, pursue the same graduate pathway because it's unlocked a really fulfilling career. So yeah, because I didn't realise that you had actually completed university. Um, for the viewers slash listeners, um, yeah. So you were actually one of my lecturers mm -hmm. and um back when I was at university. And I think you mentioned it briefly, but, you know, we didn't go into it naturally too much as, you know, we were in class. Um, but I did not realise that I knew it was something to do with university and that's all I knew, um, that you had actually completed and you decided to go back. Yeah. Was it because you had such a good experience that you craved at that time? Was it like um, the kind of freedom and fun that was with yeah. university? Were you like after that that graduation phase? Were you kind of like, no, I want to kind of get a little bit of that yeah. university experience back? Was that what kind of led you to going back? I guess to that? like on on one simple level, all of my friends were still in Birmingham. Oh right, okay. and I had moved back to Southampton, and I, um, you know, I just wanted to go and see the people that I knew. But on, on the flip side, you're right. And then part of the reason why I work at a university now is not so I can indulge in the activities of fresh as a week, uh, but because I miss that place and time. University is a really special experience. And, you know, minus going back and having my accident, 
I, I had a, you know, kind of the dream student experience, right? I went to study something that I enjoyed. I found that I was pretty good at it. I had a great, you know, not a profoundly international sporting career or something like that, but I, I really enjoyed the sport that I was doing and my extracurricular activity. I had a great bunch of friends and I felt a real connection to the institution. Uh, and yeah, it, you know, I, w I went back to see my friends and to enjoy a little bit of that utopia, I guess, that I I'd, I'd had. Um... The funny thing is that you, the university moves on, right? Almost as soon as you graduate, the the people make it. So if you're with your friends on campus, uh, then you can rekindle that belief that the institution still still remembers you or whatever. Um, but your time at university is special because of the people that you're with, uh, not the physical buildings or surroundings or whatever it may be. Uh, and I've subsequently gone back to Mermaid Fountain, where the where I had my accident several times, to kind of confront myself and to try and I know you get I mean, see an American expression, but get closure over the incident and uh, forgiveness. Ah. Uh, it's like self forgiveness, or yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's like I don't, I I don't have why me. Some people, when they have a, a really life changing injury, it's out of the blue. I don't have why me. I have why, and the answer is because I'm human and we can all be idiots. No, I think that's a very healthy way of looking at it because um, I've spoken to a few different people with um, like just a different type of events that's happened, and I think some don't have that immediately. They're definitely are like, why me, why me? Um, which is also quite a normal response either way, I think. But what tends to happen and at different stages for different people is it does convert to that why. And then maybe acceptance mm -hmm. and then kind of um, proactivity in moving forward. So for you, you kind of didn't have that why me at the start, which was, I, I think is probably yeah. a better thing. So does that mean for you, you kind of accepted it straight away or in terms of that journey of moving forward? I know obviously the um, your boss at the the work said, you know, whatever it takes will help you, which I think was, um, I very much agree with his decision there. And I think it could have been not, not a kind of like light at the end of the tunnel type thing, but like a light, yeah, right? Yeah. In terms of that kind of journey, how long do you think it took for you before you were like, right, yeah, completely moving forward now. I think I, there's an episode of The Simpsons, right, where Homer Simpson eats, like, a blowfish or something like that and the wrong bit of it, and he uh, goes through the seven stages of, like, grieving, or I can't remember how many stages there are, but in, like, an instant, like, bang, 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 bang. Um, I remember acutely a number of those. I remember anger, I remember denial, I remember bargaining, uh... I can't remember what the next few there's stages. Yearning, that, I think yearning. Yeah, and then the, then there's finally acceptance. Um, I went through a lot of those relatively quickly and probably maybe a bit faster than a lot of other people, but there are kind of stages to that happening because one of those stages is whilst you're in hospital, um, but hospital is an institution where you are really well looked after. I mean, lots of friends and families would come and visit me and they'll go, oh, make sure you look after yourself. And I'm like, I'm literally in a building surrounded by people looking after me. I'm fine. You know, and at that stage, I think it was much harder for my really close friends and family because they are also going through this trauma and seeing their young, you know, athletic son effectively you know you know lose a, a significant amount of function within his his body and potential and all the rest of it once you leave hospital you go through the second stage which is getting out there in the world again and you know learning to operate in an environment that's not completely accessible and i'm very lucky that i do have a fantastic care package around me and i've i've always had very good sort of live in care but dealing with lots of scenarios 
for the first time as a wheelchair user and the first time as a wheelchair user who's also not self-caring um and that's that's very difficult and you sort of i guess it inevitably takes a couple of years because you've got to go through the cycle of coming up against all of these first interactions with life as a wheelchair user and they they inevitably can't happen in hospital a lot of them and then you know some of them are like buses nothing happens and then all of a sudden a load of events like i don't know trying to go on holiday um getting back to work um you know going out with your mates all compile at once and you go through a really tough period and then nothing new comes along and then all of a sudden i know they say it's christmas or a a friend's stag do and they decide that they're going to go off to you know Budapest or something like that and you realize that well it's not like I can't do it but what I have to arrange and put in place to try and do it is really difficult and then you sort of go through these mini moments of grieving again where you sort of get angry and you go through denial and then you go through bargaining and but i i'm very i'm very lucky i think because i started work again and i found myself as a small cog in a big machine relatively quickly for someone in my position that a lot of that sort of stuff was dealt with in let's say maybe certainly within the first five or six years post injury Whereas for many wheelchair users, even our, you know, a decade or more after their accident, they are still going through this process of grieving and adjustment and coming to terms with 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 their new life. It's very true though, because it is a grievance process, right? And grieving is very different for mm. people. It doesn't matter what type of grieving that is. And I think that I mean, first of all, it's kind of very admirable your outlook on that and you're kind of way of looking forward and that's very difficult I suppose for anyone but it's very individual as well yeah like it's never a lot of people have been sort of like you're so brave you're so inspirational uh you're so strong do you find you just you just got on with it I, I'm just very lucky that my brain chemistry is what it is right okay. I, I I've never sat down and gone oh you know I need to be so strong in this moment or I need to be you know, particularly brave. Um, you know, part of that is probably, uh, you know, environmental. You know, my parents were people that gave me empathy, but not sympathy when I had my accident. Uh, and they, that's always been the way that they've they've sort of raised me. Um, but a lot of it is too just because I, I kind of have happiness hardwired in. And I'm very fortunate that although I have a very profound physical disability, largely I've, you know, never enormously struggled from a mental health perspective. And and that's just just luck at the end end of the day. You know, you know, some people are born six foot tall and very broad and very athletic. Other people are enormously intelligent. Other people are very naturally charismatic some people are just drop dead gorgeous uh and some people have you know really you know a lot of natural resilience and a lot of people have to work really hard on 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 resilience on stress management and stuff like that and and very fortunately i was just yeah you know i not i'm not many things but the one thing is i i'm i'm quite stoic and resilient and um and uh, yeah, I just count myself very lucky that that's the case. I can definitely sense your resilience there. Um, no, I, I just I like having these conversations because I think it there's so many pictures that can be painted from an outside perspective, right? And this is why I like having these conversations because it is individual for everyone, but I like getting, I say healthy perspectives because they're real perspectives yeah. on what it is like. Um, and I actually, um, I've had family that have had like injuries and stuff as well that were quite profound. And I remember even another family member saying, it's kind of what you brought up there with the empathy and sympathy thing, which is sometimes if we're too sympathetic, you actually can send that person into a downward spiral further. Mm. And I remember that 
um the first time I heard that I was I was younger but it was um I remember thinking oh I've never thought of it like that sometimes if you if you know pour pour this and pour that you definitely do need obviously empathy but I, yeah I remember thinking that is another side of the story which is if we can we can actually overdo it from say perspective that isn't that person we can again we don't know what that person's brain chemistry is right we don't know how their brain operates so it's a really hard hard thing to balance because if you lean on people too heavily then then they break uh, and and it's just really tough i mean i remember there was a couple of times in hospital where i started to really wallow uh and my you know my mum at the time was just like snap out of it you're still alive Okay. You yeah. still, you know, you've got a job, you've got friends and family that l love you, and you know there are a lot of people in this world who are in a much worse situation than you are, and the the uh, now that I'm a parent myself, the stoicism to say that in the right way the judgment and all the rest of it is enormous because you're right that if you, that could have sent me on a downward spiral or it could have lifted me up and it in, in that moment it lifted me up and that was exactly what i needed and and i think you know the really important thing about mental health is just that we talk about it and that we're aware of it as an issue much more there are lots of different strategies that are going to be you know, that will work for different people in different ways. But at least we're having a conversation about it because denial is, is the is the worst thing for that for that. I completely problem. agree. I think denial, you know, when you suppress something, be it in anything you could be after um just accepting that an event happened. It could be um an injury, it could be um a loss of something, like you know, relationship, job, whichever it is. Mm -hmm. I think accepting that is definitely the best way to move on, right? You put in those those next steps. Speaking of next steps, yep. Your next event, I believe, is your kind of next step in your career. Yeah. So was it your graduate no, that was your graduate role, so this is Yeah, this is sort of getting to the end of my training contract. Uh, basically, I thought I was trying really hard, I was working really hard, I was putting all the hours in, and then I found that I was not performing as strongly as I had hoped. And I had a bit of a meltdown in my appraisal, uh, and uh, I sort of explained that I'd been working all of these hours and I was really tired, uh, and uh, my appraising manager just sort of, sort of said, uh, yeah, in, in a really supportive way, who, who asked you to do all of that? And I found that, you know, and, and this was a huge learning point for me, you know, a lot of the time when you feel really stressed at work, sometimes it is the environment and sometimes it is the management and sometimes it's the leadership. A lot of the time though, it's just you. And it's you putting huge amounts of pressure on yourself to hit a quality and volume target that no one else has actually asked you to achieve. You've sought that out yourself. And um, I kind of had this mini meltdown and they sort of packaged me up and put me back together. Um, but I had this sort of realization that audit probably wasn't right for me. Very strangely post COVID, and with a lot more remote working, I think it could be a lot better. But at the time, the travel, the deadlines made it difficult. And although KPMG supported me by allocating me clients with a short commute, my then sort of 21 year old alpha, 20 something year old alpha brain went, I'm getting handouts, I'm not competing. I wanna do something where I'm just naturally in a better position. And uh, yeah, so uh, uh, my appraising uh, partner, a guy called Harry Mears, who I still know and we're still in contact with, sort of said, look, you're, I hear what you're saying. And my conclusion is that, you know, what you're saying is audit doesn't feel right for you. So you're part of this massive company of 12,000 people at the time, probably bigger now. Why don't you think about doing something else? And he put in train 
the notion that I might take some of their internal professional development courses uh, and effectively teach people how to do the job that I've been doing for the last few years. And um, so he introduced me to the department. I applied for a secondment to the training department. And after, a, you know, an interview, which was, you know, pretty straightforward, uh, I was offered a position for six months traveling around the UK to teach people how to be an auditor, how to do the job I had just been doing. And I remember having, well, I remember having a great time, but I profoundly remember sitting in front of the class just going, wow, I can do this. I can do it as well as anyone else. I find it like naturally quite easy as a wheelchair user. It almost feels like a conversation rather than a stand up and let's present. It feels quite informal, feels straightforward. And I was like, how do I do this full time? And so I spent six months having a great time. And I approached him after that six months and sort of said, look, do you have a full time position? And the answer was no, they ran a secondment model. And the answer was kind of, even if we do appoint you, your home base is going to be in Watford or Birmingham. And I was living in Southampton at the time, and I just bought a house and started to adapt it. And I was like, okay, maybe I need to think about something else. And so I started looking around and outside KPMG for the first time. Uh, and I was going through a busy season, and for anyone who's an auditor out there, they'll know this is a really tough time. But I was working on a client that was... Complicated? I know, com well, actually, no. It was so bad that it was good. It was um, so bad that it was good. Okay. Um, they regularly missed the filing deadlines. They quite regularly missed meetings with us, which made it awful, but it also meant I had a few spare half an hours just to go on the internet and see what it was about and i saw a job that was being advertised at solent university uh and uh one of those moments and i think as a piece of advice to anyone if you're struggling to fill in a job application and otherwise you're in a good space and clear-headed you don't want that job if you're struggling to fill in a job application or justify why you're good for the role, you don't want that job. And I filled in this job application. It must have taken me 20 minutes. You know, and it was 500 words or something like that. And everything just came to me because I knew that this was something that I wanted to do. Um, I actually speak about this in some of the other podcasts, but it's something I have conversations with family and stuff about as well which is um it goes into the discipline equation which i don't know if you're familiar with but the why so for example how likely you are to do something aka discipline to do that right so you have your um essentially your you know um what it is why you want to do it um what i think it's like what makes it easier i need to find this out exactly but then you have to subtract it anyway the main thing is you subtract um, the barrier, which is usually the any sort of friction, right? But sometimes that friction is, can it, that doesn't help basically when your why isn't really there. Yeah. So how much do you want something is your why, right? Yeah. So I think that's a really good piece of advice because some people obviously they are lost. I think they yeah. really don't know what, but if there is something that you're like, yeah, I kind of, this is what I need to do. My goal is to get a job. My goal is to do this but you are struggling, your brain is, is kind of telling you something. Yeah, exactly. And I was really, you know, the words came to me. I was only, I was 26 at the time. Uh, I was lucky that financially this was like a level move. And yeah, my salary probably would have carried on rising quite, you know, quite, quite substantially if I'd stayed at KPMG. But at least I knew financially I'd be moving on a level peg and I think sometimes people when they really pursue something they want they have to go gulp right I'm going to take a big haircut on on on, on pay um I think the big challenge for me was I was leaving a premier league team mm -hmm. in KPMG to go and join an institution that was not right up there in the league tables it's very good at what it does and uh 
and I, I had a great time there teaching, but it was not a Russell Group University or a Premier League team uh, in terms of institution. But I did like anyone, you know, I had a tick sheet and I was sort of saying, well, if I stay, this happens. And if I go, this happens. And one of the biggest reasons why I actually left KPMG was that if I had stayed, I'm pretty sure I'd had to have taken a job in London or elsewhere, which would have meant either moving house or just not being around people in Southampton that had been so good to me when I'd had my accident. And uh, I'm really pleased, you know, now I'm working at Southampton and um, uh, uh, and uh, I've got, you know, the other positions that I have that I still have a, a huge amount of face time with the people that I work with at KPMG. Um, in the same that I still have a great relationship with my friends from university, those that you know those are are still in place. So yeah, I I I, I did my tick sheet. I handed in my notice um, to KPMG. I I embarked on my next journey, and that was moving into education at a education focused university, which was great. Um, but one of the things I quite quickly saw was that it would be really easy for me to fall out in touch with, with what was happening in the profession. And this is where I started taking my voluntary journey with my professional institute really seriously. Um, I had been uh, part of the student professional student society. I went to a drinks event, it was upstairs and uh, there was no lift. And rather than writing a horrible email, I just thought, you know what, I'll volunteer. I'll be an ever-present reminder that everything needs to be accessible and I'll, I'll help them on that journey. But when I joined Solent University, I had to flip out of like the fun student side and go, right, how do I get in touch with the profession? Um, because at KPMG, all of that was given to you. Whereas in academia, you have to seek all of that out. And this is where I kind of want to offer, you know, if there's any advice I sort of say to people is when you're, in your early career and when you don't have necessarily, you might not have some of the, you know, complexities of a relationship or, you know, kids or something like that. Really look after what you do in your five till nine, as well as what you do in your nine till five. So your nine till five, keep your nose clean, seek out opportunities and work really hard. But in your five till nine, think about how you can develop yourself into someone that's really rounded and that takes on additional opportunities. And for me, my five till nine all of a sudden became two things. One was uh, my voluntary role with the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. And the second thing was working at Solent uh, was setting up a wheelchair rugby club, uh, wow. which I, I did it. straight after the Paralympics with the help of a, a couple of people uh, who lived nearby and who wanted to start up a club and, uh, and and a couple of people within the institution who'd been working with GB Wheelchair Rugby during the, the Paralympics. And those voluntary uh, activities have really helped round out my professional experience too. And they've been what's helped me take the next leap um, which we'll talk about later. We can talk, we can talk about that now if you want. Um, yeah, because that was your, just before we move on to that event, I just want to, you mentioned like your alpha brain. I, I'm mad into psychology. I mean, the listeners slash viewers will be sick of me going on about this because <laughs> I go on about psychology and things like that all the time. But um, you know the way you said you, you put that pressure at the start and then you said your alpha brain went into this mode and stuff like that. So I was going to ask you, um, were you always kind of that sort of person that put way too much pressure on yourself? No, I get. I guess my body had always been able to keep up, so I I was lucky at, at secondary school. I did reasonably well at A level. I did really well. I just found subjects I just fell into. So I did uh, economics, business, and law, and they just really resonated with me. And I worked hard, but I excelled quite easily. And then at university, uh, I worked hard again, but the, the grades paid 
just seemed to come off. But I never felt a physical limitation on how hard I could work because, I don't know, I was young and able, right? You know, when you're in your late teens and early 20s, you can push late nights, early mornings, and they don't have a lingering detrimental effect. Largely to do with my disability, um, rather than my age, I suppose. Um, but when I was at KPMG and I was pushing myself unnecessarily hard, I, I physically started to break down. Um, I have um, spasticity and spasms uh, that I suffer from, and I take some medication for it. But if I don't sleep well, they get worse. And guess what? If you don't sleep well your spasms, your leg spasm more, and then that causes you not to sleep. And it ends up being this sort of downward spiral. And so for the first time in my life, I really had this physical limitation on how hard I could work mentally. And, um, but yeah, I was still, you know, in my early 20s, and in some ways, you know, dumb, irrational, and full of hormones. And so when KPMG did the natural thing, which is let's look after our member of staff who's got a profound disability, let's offer him some clients, I have a you know looser reporting deadline and let's offer a shorter commute. I gratefully received those, but then somewhere in the back of my brain just said, I'm getting a handout. And so when I have my appraisal and they compare everyone, I might all of a sudden be told that I'm doing really well in the back of my head, I'll know that that's because I've been subsidised, you know, time and effort. And I think the really important thing for me at that stage was finding something I could just do well naturally. And heavens, you know, if my disability could become my superpower, and is there something that I can actually do better because I'm disabled? And really curiously, public speaking is oddly one of those things. I was going to say, what is your superpower? So I think if I if we just look at the biology of of my my accident and 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 sort of the science behind it, right? On average, people are scared of public speaking more than they are of death. If you ask people what their top ten fears are, normally public speaking comes out on average before death, which is bizarre, you, but, also bizarre but is understandable. And this is I I am not Barack Obama. I am not some sort of like natural orator who's always been really out there and charismatic and all the rest of it i was really shy when i was younger but i took some steps to address that whilst i was at uni but some of the stuff of being a wheelchair user is really helpful i can't stand up right when i present and as a result i am naturally grounded and that means my legs don't shake which sometimes they do when you're nervous and you're presenting or you do this sort of like heel toe thing or you fidget when you're you're doing that. The second thing is occasionally if people get really nervous, they get flushed in the face and they get red in the face. That can't happen to me because of the paralysis that I have. So if I do get red in the face, it's because of a side effect to my condition that means I'm really unwell. But otherwise, it's actually impossible for me to look flushed and nervous. And as a result, no one would ever know that I'm nervous. And the final thing, which is just, you know, odd, is sometimes when you are presenting and you're able-bodied, you get a little bit constricted in your breathing and, and your voice disappears. And that's because your intercostal muscles around your chest are tightening because of your anxiety and, and stuff. And again, my paralysis means that can't happen. So I only breathe diaphragmatically, which is the way that opera singers do. I'm very lucky that my lung function is still reasonable. But all of a sudden, I just sit there. It feels like a natural conversation rather than a stand-up presentation. I can't fidget. I can't go flushed in the face. If I speak, I always I speak relatively clearly because I don't lose my voice. And so, weirdly, public speaking has gone from being one of the things that people hate the most, and I didn't really enjoy, to being something that actually I can just do quite naturally. 
Um, and because lots of people hate doing it, I can always put myself forward to do something that helps out the team. I love that. Yeah. That's, yeah, again, this is what I'm saying, these perspectives on things, like, you know, I just obviously love it. Can you tell me how you have taken perhaps that superpower of yours, which is public speaking, but also your kind of journey, because I know you mentioned it there a minute ago, your third event, yeah. which is your latest career yeah. movement. Tell me about that. So I I, I started volunteering uh, seriously with the ICAW when I joined Solent University, and I kind of went through several iterations. I joined the local district society, and I, you know, volunteered to become deputy or vice president, and then you become a deputy, and then you become president of the district society. Uh, then an opportunity to join the governing council came up, uh, which I was quite nervous about putting myself forward for, but in the sort of, <laughs> I love the old Dr. Pepper adverts, which is like, Dr. Pepper, what's the worst that's what what's the worst that can happen and you're like well i'll just put myself forward let's see what happens and and the worst thing that would happen would be that there would you know be this very undiverse council governing council that looked at me at this like 20 something year old idiot why on earth are you here how dare you grace us you know with your presence we have nothing to learn from you and it was completely the opposite it was not as diverse as you might hope but they really cared and they were really excited about having someone younger and a bit different put forward their thoughts and ideas. Uh, and I did that for seven years. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I moved to the University of Southampton. I was delighted to do so. Um, lots of my friends graduated from this university. So I was really pleased to come here and have a, you know, a connection with an institution. Whoop, whoop, exactly. Yeah. No, I'm, <laughs> It, it it feels very much like being at home. It feels like very much like being at Birmingham in some ways. And I joined the university's council too. So I volunteered, joined the university senate, joined the university's council as a staff member. And again, I was really pleased to be listened to and that people really, not that I feel that I have something really profound to say, but just the fact that something a little bit different was coming across um, was really helpful. And uh, I had fin was coming up to finishing both terms uh, of those. And I thought, well, I'm really enjoying this. Let's see if I can do it outside of my immediate work or professional body. And I'm not going to lie, can I get paid for it too? And I started putting some applications out there. And so I applied to be a non-exec director at an NHS trust because I thought, as what I describe as an intensive user of the NHS, as I am now, I might be able to provide some useful perspective on that. And I was delighted to be long-listed, have a long-listed interview, and then be shortlisted for the first position I applied for. Now, everyone that I'd ever spoken to has said the non-executive career path is fraught with difficulty and challenge and here I was getting shortlisted for my first appointment. Unfortunately, it was pre-COVID and I was teaching overseas when that final interview was taking place. And because no one knew what Zoom or Teams was, uh, very sadly, they kind of said, you're ineligible to be interviewed. But, you know, you're an interesting candidate. So if there's anything similar that comes up, put yourself forward for it. And in the back of my head, I went, oh my goodness. Of course I would have got the job if I would have been interviewed. A bit arrogant, as I later found out. Um, so I'm going to put myself forward for loads of stuff. Uh, because being young and disabled and being a chartered accountant and being an academic, but also having worked in the private sector, seems to be this golden combination where I'm getting interviews for everything. How wrong was I? Uh, I spent the next year, uh, as COVID hit, applying for roles in a very variety of different places, but not really getting any interest whatsoever. Uh, and, and this is, again, a piece of advice, I suppose, to anyone watching or listening. You know, resilience in job applications is really important. Making sure that you don't do a copy and paste effort, also really important. 
but some resilience, understanding your value and understanding the story that you bring uh, uh, and the, the experiences and the skills that you bring is really important. Uh, but also just being able to deal with a no is also massively important. And it got to September 2020, start of a new academic year. My son's uh, one, or, you know, coming up to one year old. Uh, we're still teaching online or hybrid, so it's quite challenging. And I thought, right, I'm going to apply for three roles, three more roles, and then that's it. Because if I don't, if I get turned down for these, then clearly. <laughs> I was wrong and I don't yet have anything to offer and I was really lucky I applied to Motability uh, to the National Audit Office and to an, another NHS trust and all of those paid off so I joined Motability that's a pro bono uh, actually they compensate me for going part-time at the university but that's a voluntary position but a really important charity that's helping uh, disabled people uh, uh, access transport more equally uh, than others. Uh, the National Audit Office, I applied uh, to, for a non-exec directorship. I knew someone who worked there on the board. I chatted to her and she said, this is enormously ambitious. And I sort of said, I know, but this is my pitch. You know, I'm an intensive user of public services. You have a very, very, you know, you know, highly talented board, but everyone around the table kind of almost has a similar background and is in a similar stage in their career. And although I wasn't appointed to the board, they appointed me in a, a in another position. And then the NHS Trust that I applied for also came through and I joined them as well. Uh, and so having gone to got to a situation where i had been rejected for 30 roles uh in a row i then accepted for for, for three uh i thought you that took would, all of them yeah i took all of them and, and at, at this point i went part-time at the university too to try and balance balance things out and that's that's been enormously fulfilling i you know full-time jobs are important uh they're 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 you know and it's the way that most most individuals work and enter the workplace but if you have space to do something different either in a voluntary capacity in your five till nine or by carving out let's say 0.1 of a contract to do something else for 30 days it's immensely fulfilling and I, I really thought that would be my limit and I would go right no 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 more um, and then I saw the, a role at Places for People, which is the, the organization that I joined more, more, most recently. And, um, and, and, and I applied for that and I got that too. So I'm now in a situation where I kind of have five jobs, two kids, uh, one wife, uh, a very busy life. Um, but I love it. Every day is different. Uh, I still uh, enjoy everything that I do at the university, the teaching, the outreach, the enterprise activities, enormously. All of a sudden, my anecdotes from my classes are no longer sort of approaching 10 years old uh, from when I was last working in practice. They're now refreshed and renewed. And also, it's been a huge growth experience for me too. And I, I have no doubt that the other non-executives around the table are far more experienced than I am. Uh, and they are, you know, the classic non-executive route, which is go through your career, reach the top, retire out, and then give back by undertaking these roles. I, you know, I'm at a very different stage of that where I am still growing in my career, but I hope I'm providing value because I just represent something different. I have some very different life experience that I can provide the disability uh, for a lot of organizations is is helpful because they're trying to become more inclusive employers, but they don't necessarily know what that means or it, what it entails. Um, but also that perhaps I can help them connect to their more junior members of staff more easily because I'm still paying a mortgage. I've still got two young kids and a young family. 
I know what that feels like in the present rather than as a memory. And so when you are, you know, making decisions on policy and uh, investments and practices that are going to affect all of your staff, you know, maybe I, I have a closer connection to that. But it's an enormously fulfilling uh, existence and uh, I want to do more of it and I want to encourage and support you know, many of my colleagues and, and students and all the rest of it to think about um, their careers in that way because we're all working for a long period of time. You know, if you're 21, you're going to be working for probably 50 years. There's no point doing something you hate. No, I completely um, agree. And if you can do something that you love, then that's great. And if you can do something which in your early, mid and sort of early late career is full on and engaging but set you up for being able to work slightly less intensively later in your career then that's probably really helpful too no that that's really important advice um and it has come up before but i think it, the re-emphasis of it is important as well because we can all say from the surface right oh yeah um oh, i know that i know this and that that goes with lots of different type of advice but actually listening to it and taking it's a very different thing. Um, I have kind of a little ending ritual for this season yeah, for all sure, guests, sure. and you don't know no. what this is. Um, so I want you to picture Richard 10 years from mm -hmm. now, and he's here. Uh -huh. Okay, what do you think he'd say to you? <laughs> I hope he says that you, you know, thank in some ways i just hope he says thank you right in um that i'm kind of trying to do the 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 the, the right things uh i mean where do i see myself in 10 years time i hope and i i feel and this is probably i've got two young kids and a full-on life i feel quite tired uh i hope that i'm in a situation where I've moved from being a really aspirational non-executive. So at the moment, I seek out opportunities that are publicly listed and I apply for them and I regularly still get rejected from them. Uh, I hope I've moved to a situation where I've built a brand and a reputation and credibility in what I'm doing that people are approaching for me for stuff that's not listed and not made publicly available for opportunities where they really seek me out because they think I've got either an area of expertise or, or something um, where I can real add real value. But ultimately, I hope this guy that's there in 10 years is still as happy and as fulfilled as I am now because there is not much in terms of the meaning of life other than to try and obtain not some Instagram happiness, not some sugary, you know, short-term happiness, but some deep-seated contentment with who you are and what you do and the notion that you're trying to make things better for either people around you or for the next generation. And if you can achieve that in life, then you might not be remembered, but you will have made a difference yeah, it's. I actually realised this when I, I would say um, I discovered happiness personally when I woke up one morning and just felt true peace because I actually liked who I was. It's not that I was doing anything completely horrendous or anything to make me think otherwise, but a lot of people like actually think they're not happy because they sometimes they don't actually know who they are. They don't know their values. That's what I mean by that. So, um, yeah, I asked this question because sometimes you, you see that you can identify the person's values from sometimes that we get different answers for this. Like some people go, oh, this is the advice they'd give me. This is what I think of it. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, but Richard, I just want to thank you so much for Pleasure. again um, coming on, getting everything with me, Claire. Um, hope you've enjoyed yourself. Yeah, delighted. Thank you very much. No worries. Best of luck with everything.